Sarah Payne, the little girl murdered on a family outing to the seaside, the eight-year-old who changed the law. And as much as I've lost my daughter, I don't want anyone to forget her. Because if that means that one other parent doesn't go through this, then she didn't die for nothing and she's not going to be forgotten. Police emergency, what's the problem? Um, I've lost my eight-year-old daughter. What's the name of the little one that's missing? Sarah. It's what nightmares are made of. No police officer ever wants to work on a child murder. You know, we're all parents. Although there was lots of circumstantial evidence, the actual cold, hard evidence that was used in court was almost totally forensic work. You are also charged that you murdered Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne. She was a beautiful little girl with a really loving heart who has changed the world in her death. And I just wish she had been alive to change the world in her life. Littlehampton, on the Sussex coast on a summer's day. It was here that Sarah and Michael Payne brought their four children on July the 1st, 2000. It was a lovely day. It was, it was sunny, it was hot. It was about seven in the evening, I suppose. Got down to the beach and the children wanted to stay at the beach, so we stayed for a little while. It was a day out to see their grandparents, who lived a few hundred yards away. Hard to believe that what happened that day would have such shocking repercussions. Then the boys said, could they stay? And the girls asked if they could stay. And normally I would have just said, you know, no. The beach was empty, so I said yes, you know, wrongly, but I said yes. Mum and Dad left their four children, Sarah, her sister and two brothers, on the beach and went for an evening stroll, stopping off at the local pub on the way back. I shouldn't have left on the beach, I did. I didn't get home. As a parent, you make decisions no matter what and you have to live with those decisions, unfortunately. But that is what I live with. The walk back to their grandparents, Terry and Leslie, across fields and down a country lane should have taken the children no more than a couple of minutes. From the time we left the house to the time we got back, it was about an hour. Got back to the house and... Um, Les just looked at me in a strange way and said, is Sarah with you? And I said no, and it was that immediate panic. I went up to the end of the lane, but I just sensed that she definitely wouldn't have gone any further than that. So then it was back along the lane and it was calling all the time, shouting all the time. We just kept looking. You know when you lose your child in a supermarket and you can't find them, but you kind of know they're around the next corner? It was like that but intensified. It, it felt wrong. To be honest, I thought she was hurt somewhere. Lee, the Payne's 13-year-old son, had been the last person to see Sarah as they crossed the field towards their grandparents' house. Lee said that his sister had stumbled, then disappeared from view, and he'd seen something else too. Now, Lee knows cars and he knows vans and, he can, and he's got a very good memory. He said to me that he'd seen a white van and Lee turned out to be the best witness that we had. It was just beginning to get dusk and Sarah was terrified of the dark. And there's no way she'd want to be outside in the dark, there's just no way. Um, so that's when we made the call. Police emergency, what's the problem? Um, I've lost my eight-year-old daughter, she's been missing about an hour and three quarters now. Right. And um, was she playing with anybody at all? She was playing with her brothers and her little sister and she sort of walked away from them. And what's the name of the little one that's missing? Sarah. Every minute was, you know, like a ticking clock. It was just awful. I don't think any of us slept that night. 
truly believed that we would get home. In fact, I never doubted it for one second. In the immediate hours after Sarah's disappearance, police were keeping an open mind. Had she just wandered off soon to be found, or had something more sinister happened? In his statement to police, Lee Payne said that not only had he seen a white van, he also gave a description of what the driver looked like. It was a man, unshaven, with yellow teeth, and wearing a check shirt. At that time, I was a detective inspector in the Little Hampton area and had responsibility for a range of functions, including gathering intelligence on criminals and the management of sex offenders. The briefing that I gave my team was that they were to knock on the doors of the sex offenders who might have committed an offence like this, who in those circumstances tend to be very compliant. They'll do what they're told, ask them where they were when Sarah had gone missing, and hopefully, with their consent, actually get into their flat house um, and search it. No. The day following Sarah Payne's disappearance and a massive search was underway. There were helicopters and police and people from the village. I think there was two, three hundred volunteers, just people coming from everywhere just, just to look. But I just didn't think anyone could harm her. I just felt that she would have talked anyone out of hurting her. Sunday evening, and police knocked on the front door of a 41-year-old car mechanic who lived a few hundred yards from the Littlehampton seafront. Police wanted to know his whereabouts when Sarah had gone missing. His name was Roy Whiting. He said he'd been in Littlehampton. He travelled across to the Brighton Hove area to a fun fair, and had then travelled straight back. But the sort of answers that he was giving were very nervous ones. So they came away and um, just went around the corner and telephoned uh, my sergeant, who telephoned me. In the meantime, Whiting came out from his address, went round the corner to South Terrace, the seafront road, to a white van. Whiting had bought the white Fiat van just a few days before Sarah's disappearance. Police also had doubts about his alibi, which didn't seem to add up. He claimed he'd driven straight back from Brighton, Yet in his van was a receipt from a petrol station putting him 10 miles north of the route he said he had taken to get home. On what basis did we arrest him? Nervousness on his part. He gave us an alibi that we weren't happy with. Um, so we were stretching things as it, as it was to get him in custody. But there was another reason why Roy Whiting was a suspect. In 1995, Whiting had been convicted for an indecent assault on an eight-year-old girl in Crawley, 35 miles away. Cruising around the town on a winter's afternoon, he had bundled the girl into his car before taking her to a wooded area and assaulting her. He'd then dropped her home. Roy Whiting was well known to Paul Williams. He had interviewed him in Littlehampton when he was released from prison after serving half of his five-year sentence. This is a man who had committed a serious predatory offence against a little girl. He just had no appreciation or understanding, really, of what he'd done, why he had done it, and whether he would do it again. After his release, Whiting had been seen hanging around a local swimming pool. Police put him under surveillance in case he tried to commit another offence. My conclusion was that you know, he, he posed a significant risk. Uh, I didn't put it in terms of high, medium or low. There had to be a chance that he would do that again. Roy Whiting was just one of hundreds of sex offenders questioned about Sarah Payne's disappearance. Desperate to find her, her parents appealed to whoever might be holding their daughter. Let her go. Let her go. Or her if, go. if you know that someone's got an extra child somehow, or, yeah. or, or whatever, you know, get in touch with your local police, you know? Look around you, everybody. Everybody, just look around you. As Sarah's parents made their appeal, Roy Whiting was being questioned. Right, well, Whiting gets interviewed. Uh, the problem is there's not a great deal to interview him about. Uh, we've still just got a missing girl. How far away from her were you in your vehicle when you first saw her? 
Over three days of questioning, Roy Whiting maintained a defiant no comment. There was nothing the police could do. My experience has led me to absolutely know there's only one way to investigate something, and that is to keep an open mind at all times. No. Is there anything that you don't understand about what I've asked you over the past few days? No. There was strong circumstantial evidence but we didn't have enough evidence to charge him. Roy Whiting was released, but police kept hold of his van. They wanted to carry out forensic tests on its contents. Meanwhile, the search for the missing eight-year-old, Sarah Payne, carried on. It just didn't feel right, it just felt wrong. It was just loud and noisy, just a normal family, and two boys, two girls, and so they were kind of like, why haven't you got her back yet? You're the person that we trust. Why isn't she home? And I couldn't answer, and I just kept saying, she'll be home soon, she'll be home soon. That's all I could say. July the 4th, 2000. It was now 72 hours since Sarah Payne had gone missing while on a day out to the Sussex coast with her family. The search for the eight-year-old girl was now nationwide and becoming increasingly desperate. There were even reports that she had been sighted more than 200 miles away in Cheshire. I walked in on day three of the inquiry, and that's when I first met Sarah. There was no margin for error with Sarah Payne. Her daughter was alive, end of. We've got just over 500 actions. That's 500 different jobs that we've gone out to do in trying to find Sarah. None of us were ever allowed to talk about anything other than Sarah coming home alive. We always imagined, every time we looked at a camera, that Sarah was looking back. And that if she could see doubt in our mind, she would worry and she'd be scared. We're trying to stay as positive as we possibly can, you know? And Sarah, if you're watching, Mummy loves you. And we miss you. And we're looking for you, darling, and we're going to find you. We're going to find you. And you'll be home. You'll be home, darling. Uh, yeah, I'm still hopeful. We've got to we speak. Are. We've got to keep our, try and keep our spirits up in some way. Well, I remember when we walked out the press conference, a police officer uh, in um, an informal chat, really, made reference to the fact, um, I think he used the words, God forbid, if the worst has happened. Um, and Sarah had absolutely exploded and said, you know, don't ever talk about that in front of me. Wouldn't allow anyone to say that anywhere near me. If that's your thought, go away. Take it away. I don't need anything negative or anything nasty. She doesn't need to see that and I don't need to hear it because I didn't want that getting through to her. Codenamed Operation Maple, the search for Sarah Payne was and still is the biggest investigation that Sussex Police has ever mounted, bigger even than the Brighton bomb. Nearly one third of its officers were involved in the hunt for the missing schoolgirl. It was a massive job, no question about it, massive. And it cost three million pounds, which is a significant amount of money. I would do briefings in the morning with detectives and there'd be 90 officers. Following his initial arrest and questioning, Roy Whiting left Littlehampton. He remained the prime suspect and his van was still being examined but police lacked any firm evidence to link him with Sarah Payne's disappearance. Whiting returned to Crawley, scene of his earlier offence against an eight-year-old girl, to live with his father. He was now under round-the-clock surveillance. The primary reason for uh, putting him under surveillance was that if Sarah was alive, he could lead us to her. She could have been in a building somewhere, in a, in a, locked up in a caravan somewhere, he also could have got rid of the clothes or some other evidence. I didn't want him to leave the country. I wanted to know where he was 24 hours a day.